Good afternoon. I, I'm happy to welcome all of you um, to this final episode of our last uh, history series uh, for the season, this one uh, covering the 2018 elections, a first look at political history. I'm Judy Woodward, the history coordinator for the Ramsey County Library, and I am delighted to welcome our speaker today who informed me that this is the fourth appearance uh, of uh, David Schultz from Hamlin and the University of Minnesota Law Schools. He must be good because everybody keeps coming back. And uh, we're so pleased to have him. Um, Professor Schultz's appearance is made possible today by two sources that I must thank. First of all, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota are a wonderful co-sponsor and partner in these programs, and then Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, uh, the financial underwriter of the series. That fund came into being uh, as a result of the passage of the Legacy Amendment in 2008 by the voters of Minnesota. So basically, I'm thanking everyone here and everyone listening for making these programs possible. And now I would like to turn the podium over to Professor David Schultz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for having me again. And my talk today is going to not just be, I guess, a postmortem on the 2018 election. By now, you've heard lots of the postmortems. Although I'm going to try to sort of give you some sense of what I think happened in it, also. But what I want to do is take us back, maybe as as the context is here more of a historical sense, and to try to understand something about the 2018 elections, perhaps in a longer cycle or a longer pattern of American history. Now, there's several ways that I can introduce my talk today. You know, one of them is when people were asking me initially, well, how do I describe what happened in the 2018 election? And what I said to many people is that there was a point some point that happened on Tuesday night a few weeks ago, might have been about 10 o'clock, might have been about 11 o'clock that night, that suddenly the 2016 presidential race ended and the 2020 presidential race started. And the reason why I say that in many ways is that a lot of what happened in the 2018 elections just a few weeks ago was both a playing out of 2016, kind of like the last act of what happened there, but at the same time, it was also really the opening shot overture, I think, of the 2020 election. And, and I think that's one good accurate description. A second way, if I'm looking for introductions in terms of how to describe what happened, is one way of describing it was to use the journalism language of blue referring to, of course, Democrats, red referring to Republicans, um, is to say that the blue wave hit the red wall. Um, that will be a second way of describing it. But the third way that I think is even more interesting in terms of describing or perhaps describing, and I'm going to say perhaps because I'm going to want us to have a conversation eventually about this, um, is to ask to what extent the election that just happened perhaps uh, three weeks ago um, is part of what we would call as political scientists something called critical realignments or critical elections in American politics or history. Now, of course, we always think that presidential elections are critical. We always think that elections are, are very important. But if you were to listen to political scientists, for example, one of my favorites from many years ago, Walter Dean Burnham, um, wrote a book called um, Critical Elections in the Main Springs of American Politics. Um, uh, I'm going to give you probably some book titles in the process here. It is a library, after all, so I think I'm, un I'm entitled to reference books or something like that. Uh, I had a student once who got mad at me and said, for, after one of my lectures, why do you always um, give me suggestions for books to read? And I kind of looked at him and said, because I think it's my job as a professor to do that. Uh, 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 but hopefully here, uh, you'll sort of look upon some of these book titles, um, as I maybe reference them, as, as a good way to go read. You know, go read upon something and um, get some more background on some topics here. But Walter Dean Burnham and other political scientists sort of noticed a pattern over time in American history. And I'll give you some dates. 1800, 1828, 1860, 1896, 1936, 
and then we're going to put a question mark um, after that. And that question mark could be 64 or 68 or 1980 or 2008 and maybe 2016 now. And I'll explain all those dates in a few minutes here. But one of the things that Walter Dean Burnham and other political scientists and really political historians have noticed over time is that approximately at about every 25 to 30, 35 years or so, let us say about every generation or generation and a half, there appears to be a particularly significant presidential election or a couple of elections in American history that do some fundamental things. Uh, among those things that these critical elections do is they display um, things such as high voter turnout or extraordinary high voter turnout compared to normal elections. Um, additionally, we see that, obviously what goes with it, um, that there's incredible amounts of enthusiasm surrounding that election. Oftentimes, these critical elections are coming in the middle of or sometimes break um, intense polarization or partisanship that we see in our society where, where public opinion is hugely divided. But more importantly, what we oftentimes see with those critical elections is really a transformation of party politics in fundamental ways. And I'll start to lay this out obviously in a little bit more detail, but what we oftentimes will see in these critical elections is that the coalitions, the people who compose those political parties, the voters, their members, suddenly those old coalitions break down. We start to see a shifting of alliances or allegiances where, where people who might have at one time, let's say, voted Whig, you know, to take us back to the 19th century, shift from voting Whig to maybe voting for this newly emerging thing called the Republican Party. Um, or, or they shift from, let's say, maybe the Federalist to the Anti-Federalist. So, so, so these are elections that see this, this transformation, a breakdown of normal party alliances and really a reconstituting, um, rebuilding of political parties. Additionally, these critical elections oftentimes mean what? An emergence of a new majority or dominant political party that then sort of sets the political agenda, the policy agenda for about another what, generation or so. So these critical elections are, are really kind of interesting because there does seem to be, up until the 1960s or so, um, a pretty regular pattern in terms of seeing these transformations in American political parties over time. And let me talk about each one of those just briefly so I can start to set some context here. Because the question that I'm going to want us to think about here, and this is going to be like when we get to the question answer point here, this is going to be a, a little bit of, I guess, some. Um, I guess discussion is really going to be in terms of what your sense is, is that are we undergoing right now a critical realignment politically in the United States? Um, and then with that, if so, what is that potentially portending for the future? And I'll tell you what I'm thinking at this point so you know where I'm headed here, is that I do think we're, we're in the middle of a pretty significant political realignment in the United States. And that realignment um, is, is going to continue for probably a couple more of election cycles with the result that what we're going to see probably in about 10 years, 12 years, is going to be an American political system um, that's going to look dramatically different than it looks now. Now, I don't mean institutions necessarily. What I mean is in terms of the polarization we'll, that we're seeing right now, which is pretty intense, is going to largely break in about a decade start to subside, we're going to see a, a, sh a shifting of the policy agenda. And what I mean by that, the types of issues that are being fought over uh, the how and, and how the parties are set up. So that's what I'm going to want us to think about here, that I think there's an incredible amount of data, incredible amount of evidence that suggests that 2018, or since 2018 was the final word on 2016 and the first word on 2020, um, that somewhere in there we're looking at, at really a process of, of significant political realignment, not just nationwide, but perhaps also uh, we could talk about this even at the state level in terms of what it's meaning for the, for the Democrats and Republicans.
But let's think about those elections. Let's think about those elections that I mentioned here, and starting with 1800, um, briefly here. Why 1800 is an incredibly important election in American history. And some people say maybe the most important election in American history. It involved what? The first peaceful transfer of political power in the United States from one party to another. And we forget about this, is that when George Washington, you know, was picked as president in 1788, George Washington, for the most part, was, was a, a nonpartisan, or at least a nonpolitical person, in the sense that political parties didn't exist. I mean, yes, many of us remember our American history. There were the Federalists, there were the Anti-Federalists. But in terms of formal political parties, um, they really didn't exist. They don't start to emerge until 1796. And in what I have my students read, um, um, and what I think is one of the great speeches of American history, when George Washington um, does his farewell speech in 1796, he laments the rise of political parties as potentially dividing the country in very bad ways. Um, um, it may be a speech that many of us should go back and look at once in a while, simply because old George might have gotten it right you know, a long time ago. Um, but his successor was John Adams. Um, um, his successor is John Adams, and of course Thomas Jefferson, and, he's, he's, and by the way, Adams is part of the Federalist Party. John Adams is facing his chief rival in 1800 with Thomas Jefferson, the head of the Democratic Republican Party at that point, which eventually becomes the uh, sort of the, the, the forerunner to the modern Democratic Party. And in 1800, Thomas Jefferson and, and the Democratic Republicans defeat the Federalists, oust them from the House, oust them from the Senate, oust them from the presidency, and they take over. And it's significant because there were no cannons in the streets, there were no military um, um, rumors of coups, et cetera, et cetera. And what I mean in terms of for American politics to experience in a very young republic a peaceful transfer of power from one party to another set enormous precedent for the, almost the rest of American history. And what happened with that election is, is that we saw that the Democratic Republican Party, I might just abbreviate to Democratic Party to make it easier, became the dominant party um, in American politics. The Federalists kind of fade out. If you know a little bit of your history, it goes from Jefferson it then goes to, um, it goes to Jefferson, to Madison, Monroe. Um, the Democrats had a pretty good string there in terms of, of winning the White House and holding Congress. Um, um, but they, they sort of set the pattern. They set the pattern in terms of really becoming the major political party, defining the political agenda for quite a while. The next date that, that American historians like to point to um, is, is 1828. 1828 is when Andrew Jackson um, wins the presidency. And he too wins as a Democrat. But what it means to be a Democrat at that point shifts. The base of the Democratic Party shifts at that point from, from being more of this kind of agricultural kind of party, um, to, um, kind of like, let's say, Virginia, kind of middle part of the country, to, remember, keep in mind, this is 1828 to where part of the base of the Democratic Party becomes the western part of the United States, you know, Kentucky, um, Tennessee, um, the far, far out west like that. Um, um, and the Democratic Party shifts from mostly being farmers to what? Rising um, business people, kind of middle class people. So that the composition of the Democratic Party shifts, and it's going to be important to think about here, because as compositions of parties shift, as the membership changes over time, that of course is going to possibly mean what? The issues that the party cares about, the, the agenda, um, the policies that they articulate will change over time. So the Democrats move from being the party of primarily farmers to more of what? Westerners and, and kind of middle class business people. Um, that's a pretty big shift for the party. There's stories to be told also about how around this time parties like the Whig Party starts to form uh, um, and eventually you know, becomes you know, a rival to the Democrats. But the next critical election 
that historians place us at is 1860. It is what? Of course, the emergence of the Republican Party and the Republican Party with Abe Lincoln, you know, win their first presidential election. Um, for all kinds of reasons, we know uh, that 1860 is a critical election in American history. Uh, um, it's the what? It's Lincoln gets elected, Fort Sumter gets fired on, uh, Civil War starts. That's, that's pretty consequential, I think we could say. Uh, and also, I will point out and say, for everybody who always used to say to me, in the last few years, isn't American politics more polarized and antagonistic now than ever in American history? I say, I think the Civil War kind of beat it a little bit or something like that. Uh, just a tad, right, or something like that. But no, so the, the Republicans become what? They become the, the majority party. And remember the party of, of Abe Lincoln. It was the party of what? It was the party of abolition. It was the party of civil rights. Um, it was the party of a nationalist party of holding the union together. Um, in Minnesota, and I wish High Berman, some of you might remember High Berman who taught at the U, who no way, as a joke would be, he forgot more about Minnesota history than all of us ever collectively actually knew. I'm an incredible person, um, really is. Um, 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 but if we go back to Minnesota history, you know, even the divide between the Democrats and Republicans at the Minnesota Constitutional Convention played it out. The Republicans were the party of abolition, and they were the party of what? Prohibition, of us entering the union as a dry state. Uh, uh, the Democrats were the party of not supporting abolition, or at least not supporting um, voting rights for, for freed slaves, and they were the wet party. Um, you can make any conclusions you want about that afterwards. Um, but clearly, they, they were very different parties um, nationwide. And the Republicans became essentially the dominant party, you know, for what? The next three decades or so, if not longer. 1896, William Jennings Bryan versus William McKinley. Uh, uh, that, that what some people argue is maybe the greatest political speech in American history is William Jennings Bryan's cross of gold speech, talking about the need to do what? to help farmers in the Midwest and in the prairies by extending the currency to also recognize silver um, and not just gold as a way of easing credit. But this election is, p is pointed to because the Democrats become what? The party of, of, of the Midwesterners, of the farmers. Um, 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 the, the McKinley is representing what? The East Coast business establishment. Um, um, and that mold holds in place until 1896, not 1896, until 1936. It is, it is the FDR coalition, of course. Uh, what, what emerges out of the 1936 coalition um, is the Democratic Party that sort of even to this day exists, although by the time I get done today, I'll explain to you why that coalition is breaking down. But nationwide, the Democratic coalition became the party of what? A party that linked together labor unions, linked together farmers. At that point, it linked together, let us say, um, the Catholic vote, which was not as strong as it is now, but an emerging Catholic vote at that point. However, it wasn't necessarily the party of civil rights. Remember, this is a party that was still solidly grounded in the South. Um, it was still winning all the states in the South. Why? Remember, it was the Democratic Party that, that supported slavery, opposed abolition, opposed civil rights during the Civil War era. So the Democrats kind of had this uneasy relationship. At least in the South, they were not um, a party of civil rights. Maybe up in the North they were, but they were a party of immigrants. Right. That's the core coalition. That was the core coalition for the Democratic Party um, that emerged. Uh, obviously in Minnesota, for those of us who, again, who know a little bit of our Minnesota history, with the creation of the Democratic, or the merger of the Democratic and farmer labor parties um, you know, in the, in the 1940s, we brought together Again, those three critical coalitions. The farmers from rural Minnesota, we brought, we brought together labor, which was not just the labor unions, but it was also, for our purposes, what? It was also the workers up on the Iron Range. Um, and, and it brought together the members of the Democratic Party, which were the cities. And so nationally and statewide, there's this core coalition that held together. 
And we could look at that coalition for the Democrats and Republicans geographically in terms of maps where they were, but we could also look at in terms of, especially for the Democrats, that at least until 1968, they were the dominant political party in the United States and in Minnesota. If you asked people's party affiliation, far more considered themselves to be Democrats or DFL. If you looked at who was winning Congress, who was winning the presidency, if you were looking at public policy, it definitely was that the Democrats were actually the party in, in, in place. And it's a party that didn't look like the party of what? William Jennings Bryan, or the party that looked like Andrew Jackson, or the party that looked at looked like what? The party that looked like the one of Thomas Jefferson. Similarly, the Republican Party was a party um, that, that had emerged, that be, became one that was what? A, a pro-business um, party, and that it had its basis of support in some of these things called rising suburbs at an earlier point, um, but clearly it was drawing from, more, from a more affluent strata of our, of our society. Well, starting perhaps in 1964 and then accelerating, that coalition starts to break down. Barry Goldwater, running for president in 1964, wins a few seats in the South. 1968, Richard Nixon wins the presidency with an explicit what? Southern strategy. Famous line, Lyndon Johnson, in signing the 1964 Civil Rights Act, pens it and says uh, that with this act, the Democrats have lost the South for the rest of the century. Uh, he probably was underestimating that um, uh, uh, in terms of the potency and the endurance of, of the Democrats' losses in the South. Um, there's a great book called Chain Reaction uh, by the Etzels, E-D-S-E-L-L-S, -E -L -L that really sort of talk about the, 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 the movement from the signing of the 64 Civil Rights Act in terms of how the Democrats lost the South. Really outstanding book to look at here. Um, but what we started to see is that the Republicans were, were successfully starting to appeal to, let's say, white Southerners. Remember, Richard Nixon was talking about what? The silent majority, uh, those people who seemed to be somewhat um, um, hidden, uh, those people who were concerned about law and order, who still supported the Vietnam War. A shift was starting to occur. I should also point out, when I give my talks on polarization, that when people say, again, this is the most polarized, that is the present we've ever been, after the Civil War, I point out to people and say that for those of us who remember the 60s, a president was assassinated, his brother was killed, a civil rights leader was killed, um, the country was hugely divided by the Vietnam War, and for those of us who grew up on the East Coast watching the urban cores of many cities across the United States get burned down, things were pretty ugly back then also. Uh, uh, and, and I wanted to say that the 60s were far worse uh, than anything today. Of course, the week before the election this year, when you have pipe bombs being sent um, and a synagogue um, 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 blown up, that kind of made you wonder, had we actually gone back to the 60s in terms of how dangerous things were? But I mention it that, that Nixon starts it, Reagan accelerates it even more. That Reagan's election, we start to hear about what? The Reagan Democrats. Uh, working class America moving more over, workers moving over from, from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Issues such as what? Uh, such as uh, Roe versus Wade and about reproductive rights issues start to move many of the Catholics um, who used to vote for Democrats, move them over into the Republican front um, in terms of the Republican Party. So we start to see somewhere in 68, see somewhere going perhaps to 1980 or so, a shift, working class America is moving. We also know labor unions in terms of a percentage of, uh, or, or, or a percentage of our population collectively bargain is going down dramatically. So as a leg, as a leg for the Democrats, that's starting to erode. Working class white America is moving in the direction of, of um, Republicans. We're seeing that the suburbs, 
solidly Republican at that point, especially, I'm gonna come back to it and point out that suburban women, suburban white women, are voting solidly Republican at that point, and that's gonna be important to understand for something about what's happening in American politics now. Uh, and the Democratic Party, as a result of the 64 Civil Rights Act, is increasingly now becoming the party of people of color, um, the party of civil rights. So something's changing here. I mean, you look at the pattern here. Who's becoming what part of what coalitions? Can you see? Think of it as like a jigsaw puzzle or something like that. The pieces are starting to change around. Right. I'll get us to the current election in a few minutes here. Why critical realignments, though? Why do they happen? Well, Walter Dean Burnham and others argue at least two reasons, and I'm going to throw a third reason in. The first reason that Walter Dean Burnham argues is to say that Critical realignments occur if there's some significant political or economic crisis that precipitates a, 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 a shift. For example, a civil war, a Great Depression, um, some major, major, um, you know, you know, economic factor can clearly, you know, um, you know, transform American politics. How so? People who suddenly become rich or become poor, or or some other phenomena happens, you know, that affects their economics, um, might translate over into how they think about the world politically. Second, is he sometimes says, uh, are that he that is. Um, Walter Dean Burnham says that technological changes can force changes in terms of, of how people act, po act politically. Um, by that, it could be communication technologies in terms of how people gather information. It could be what? It could be technology unemploying people or employing people. Again, having some kind of shift in terms of how people um, um, earn a living. And then the third that I throw in, the one that I find the most fascinating is actually generational shifts, is that over time we have people who, who are born of one generation, socialized to think about the world in one way, who eventually exit the political system um, and are replaced by a new generation of people socialized in a different way. In a whole different talk, and maybe I should come back at some point and just do this on generational politics because it's actually quite fascinating, um, is that we know that people from different generations view the world politically different. We know, and all of you who are parents um, or grandparents know what I'm talking about here in the sense that somewhere in adolescence, whatever we mean by adolescence is kind of up for grabs now anymore, huh? but at some point in adolescence, we form a set of values that endure with us for the rest of our lives. Much in the same way that our adolescence is impressionable in so many other ways, and you all know that, we all have those first things that we remember as, as teenagers, or when we break away from our parents, we form our own identity. But we know generally that that's politically the case tr also. Lots of people want to think that, well, of course, as we get older, our political views change. We move from being what, perhaps very liberal to very conservative? But for the most part, that's not true. The political views that we form in our adolescence largely stick with most of us for the rest of our life. And when a generation of people come to sort of experience major events through a, through a lens collectively, that oftentimes affects, that often, All right, I can out-talk her. I can out-talk her, hell. All right. Uh, uh, that we know each generation seems to form a collective identity. Um, I've told people uh, in other talks, for example, that back in 2008, when, when John McCain was running against Barack Obama, the way to capture that generational shift, how people from different generations think about the world, is I showed two clips to students and, to, and I was on tour in Europe at the time giving talks. 
the two, the three clips actually. Clip number one showed, some of you might know this, a famous BBC newsreel of Neville Chamberlain returning from Munich, waving a piece of paper saying, I have assurances from Herr Hitler that we have blasting peace. Six months later, we're in, uh, Germany invades Poland, World War II starts. The second one, many of you have seen, the sinking of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. The third scene, it is 1975, and it is helicopters over the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, rescuing Americans and others as the United States has lost the war. And I said, for people of John McCain's generation, those first two clips were all about what? The world is a dangerous place. U.S. military might can solve the problems, and I, as John McCain, a military person, am fit to rule the country. For Barack Obama's generation, it is about what? The limits of U.S. military power, that you can't bomb everybody into submission, and perhaps something else is necessary. I only mention these because, because what we've seen over time in all those previous critical realignments are different generations come of age, come to power, pass away, to be eclipsed by a new generation of people bringing a different set of ideas. And the question we have to now think about is, is sort of twofold here. Where are we right now in terms of American politics in 2018, in 2020, going into the elections here? Are we starting to experience something that looks like a critical realignment? a pattern that we've seen in these previous elections. And again, my argument is yes. I might have, the last time I was here, spoken a little bit about understanding America over the last 40 years. I'll do that again, just briefly to set the context. That if we were to take us back to 2016, uh, can I walk over to the board here? Away from the microphone for a second? I'll do it anyhow. That is supposed to be a bell curve. That is supposed to be a bell curve. I'm not a good artist, so pardon me. That is supposed to be a bell curve that would have captured American public opinion in 1976. That if we were to draw a dotted line down the middle, which is where the center is, what we would know is the vast majority of voters in the United States would have considered themselves to be what? Centrists. We would have had some liberals, some conservatives. Most people were dead in the center. And we know. that the centers for the Democratic and Republican parties were not very up far, to, far apart from one another. Now, I oftentimes tell people at this point that one of my heroes is Willie Sutton, the bank robber, <laughs> whose great line when asked why you rob banks, he responded by saying, because that's where the money is, um, um, was, was quite brilliant. And I oftentimes ask people, if in 1976 public opinion looked like that, if you are the Democratic and Republican parties, what kind of candidate would you nominate for office? And of course the answer would be what? A centrist. Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford was exactly that picture, two centrists running. And that would be important to understand because the parties were converging together. The parties back then were what we call coalitional and not ideological. The Democratic Party would have had a Jimmy Carter, a, a Ted Kennedy, and probably what, I'm trying to think of some southern white racist, you know, um, um, Democrat back then. I don't know who it would be, you know, come, somebody could help me with the history or something. Lester Maddox. Lester Maddox or somebody like that. But you know what I'm getting at here. The Republican Party um, would have had people ranging anywhere from Barry Goldwater to Jacob Javits to Nelson Rockefeller. And the parties could actually get along because what? They were, it, they were not ideological. They were ideologically mixed. Additionally, back then, we also know that approximately one-third of the members of the House of Representatives came from swing districts, districts that in any given election could vote Democrat or Republican. And that was important because no party had enough votes in the Congress to drive their agenda on their own. They had to get cooperation. And with that, also because there were 120 swings, they held the balance of power. They had what? 
the incentive to compromise. Because if they went too far to the left, too far to the right, they were out of office. The final characteristic that I'm going to get us to 216. The final characteristic is the fact that about 10 to 15 percent of the voters were swing voters at that point. By swing, we would mean either split ticket voting or one election would vote Democrat versus one election voting Republican. That, that's our picture. But something happened. Something happened in 40 years. The bell curve shifted. It now looks like a double hump camel's back or take that original bell curve, step on the center, squish it apart. The percentage of our population that considers themselves to be centrist has actually gone down dramatically. The two parties have moved away in terms of their centers from one another. If Willie Sutton is correct, you would not nominate a candidate for office now who would be in the center, because why? There are no voters there. You would pick what? Or not, I don't want to say no voters, but not many. You have to pick candidates who are closer to the centers of your parties. And you'll notice that the two party centers are moving further and further apart. That's part of that polarization. Additionally, we know that over time, the, the, the number of people in the House who would be considered to be coming from swing districts dropped from 120 to roughly 24 seats. And what it means to be a swing voter changed. To be a swing voter now is about 5 to 10 percent of the population. But to be a swing voter now means not do you split ticket vote, but do you swing in or swing out from voting? Do you show up on election day or not show up on election day? And the three most critical swing voters in terms of not individual persons, but individual groups are suburban women, which people still talk about. And I still use the word you know, soccer moms. You know, maybe that's not accurate, but it's suburban women, people of color and people under the age of 30. Suburban women are especially fascinating. Back in 1976, 1980, if I were to go out to a place like Minnetonka, women there were voting Republican with their husbands solidly Republican, a place like Minnetonka, solidly Republican, um, Bloomington, Minnesota would have been solidly Republican. Um, I'm going to guess that perhaps maybe even Roseville, you know, um, back then was probably leaning more Republican than it was Democrat, um, although I'd have to t double check some of my statistics on this one. But what started to happen is that, especially with suburban women, while their husbands continued to vote Republican, they moved away from the Republican Party, partly because the Republicans were, were not talking about what? Issues such as, as reproductive rights or talking about what I call family security issues, education or, or um, health care, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why this is important is that by the time we get to it, roughly 2016, what we saw across the United States is several fascinating things occur over a 40-year period. We saw, for example, economically, the gap between the rich and poor shift from 76 to 2016 to be the greatest gap in American history or since the 1920s. And because that gap had emerged, we now were living in very different worlds, rich versus poor. The number of integrated economically integrated neighborhoods had dropped dramatically, rich versus poor. Second, there's a wonderful book by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort. The Big Sort talks about how Democrats and Republicans have geographically sorted themselves out, that, that Democrats want to live in some places, Republicans in some other places, um, and they have sorted themselves out in very different ways. And we've also seen over a 40-year period the exiting of what? What Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation and, and the emergence of the parties that have put us to where we sort of were going into 2016. That the core base for the Republican Party 
was what's called the silent generation. Those born roughly between 1925, 1944. At its height, about 55 million people um, of the most recent generations, the most white, most Caucasian, most Christian, most religious. The, the set for the Democrats, their core base was what? The baby boomers, the younger baby boomers at 77 million people. Not quite as white, not quite as Christian, not quite as Caucasian, but still we're looking in the 90s, high percentages. But then out there, for our purposes, I could spend way more time talking about all these, we have a group of people called the millennials, born between 82 and 2000, who are about 80 million people, and now the emergence in the last election cycle or so of Gen Z, even larger. These groups, two generations, are enormously large. They are the, the least white, least Christian, least religious, and the highest percentage immigrant of any generations in American history. Except these generations aren't completely sold on the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. They don't align up in the same way. What they care about in terms of issues are, are different. The reason why I mention all of this is that th what happened in 2016, and there's lots of ways, and when I get to q and I'll talk about this too. What happened in 2016 is that Trump gets the nomination. Why? Because he is the outsider for many white working class America who used to see good paying jobs in the mines, good paying jobs at General Motors, at, at let's say U.S. Steel, and saw those jobs go away, who saw over a 40 year period saying, I voted Democrat and nothing helped me. I voted Republican, nothing helped me. Trump spoke to them in terms of somebody who was outside the, the two parties in a way. For Clinton, there's lots of stories as to sort of the problems that Clinton faced in her election. But she became the face of what? The status quo. The face of, of, of perhaps for many people, of, of, of what was wrong with American politics. And what happened in 2016 wasn't so much that, that Trump got more votes, uh, dramatically more votes um, that Mitt Romney did um, four years earlier is that Democrats largely stayed home on election day in Minnesota and nationwide. Women, especially suburban women, stayed home or, um, or they, if they voted, they wouldn't vote for Clinton for a whole bunch of reasons. Young people stayed home. People of color stayed home. In Minnesota, Donald Trump only got 2,000 more votes in 2016 that Mitt Romney got four years earlier. The big difference was what? Hillary Clinton got 180,000 fewer votes. And we could identify where it happened, Hennepin County and in Ramsey County. Um, Democrats stayed home on election day. So, so what we were looking at in 2016 is a shift occurring, and we could start to see the signs. I've been telling people that if you look at Minnesota as a perfect microcosm of the United States, and it actually is in so many ways, there were two counties, Mauer County, where Austin, Minnesota is, uh, Olmsted County, where Rochester is, that were fascinating. Historically, Austin, where Hormel was, labor, always voted Democrat. It flipped Republican. Rochester, Minnesota, which used to be classic voting Republican, affluent Mayo Clinic, IBM, has all but flipped Democrat now. The shift has started to occur, and we saw that in 16. So going into 18, we're starting to see white working class America, labor, moving dramatically out of the, Republic, out of the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. We're seeing labor move from the Democrats over to Republicans. Those without college degrees, again, another sign of working class, moving from Democrats to Republicans. And we started to see what? We started to see increasingly better educated, college educated people moving towards the Democratic Party. Pretty good correlation statistics. But as I mentioned to you, some of these groups, especially women, people of color, and, and, and um, um, young people, stay home on election day 
in 16. I don't have to go through a lot of what Donald Trump um, has said in the last couple of years. I don't have to sort of recite, I think, a lot of the language about, about or the, he had, or talk about people such as, um, um, well, we'll do any ranging from Bill Cosby to a whole bunch of others, that, that suburban women became highly motivated. The Brett Kavanaugh hearings uh, with Dr. Ford testimony, further highly motivated. And what we saw on election day this past year was something really quite remarkable, is that, is that this became the election that, if it wasn't clear before, suburban women, college-educated suburban women, basically became the most powerful voting bloc in the United States. About a week before the election, I was out at Minnetonka High School, and I was speaking to the students, and, you know, this is the third district, Eric Paulson, Dean Phillips race. And I said to them that where you are living is ground zero for American politics. I said that unlike in 2016, where the geography of politics was statewide, here the geography of politics was going to be in the suburbs, especially in suburban, affluent suburbs, dominated by better educated people. And that in that election, even though, as I mentioned to you before, normally we would say there were only 24 or so swing seats in the House of Representatives, because of so many Republicans opting not to run for re-election, some of them because of distaste for Donald Trump, some for other reasons, there were approximately 70 or 80 congressional seats up for play in 2018, of which only one of those seats was presently held by a Democrat. The vast majority, in fact, almost all of them by Republican. And I said to my st these students out in Minnetonka that, that the third congressional district was a microcosm of, of the fight for the 2018 election. The third district in Minnesota, many of you know, is of course quite affluent, but it is also the single best educated congressional district in the United States in terms of percentages of college degrees and so forth. And the women who are there have the highest percentage of college degrees of probably any group of women in any congressional district in the United States. Um, so I said, this is a pretty remarkable district. Uh, uh, and I said to them, um, and there's a great line here, I said to them, your mothers are really important. And one of the students got mad at me and said, what are you talking about my mother about for? And I said, no, I'm not picking on her. I said, she's tremendously important. And if she shows up here and they win, the Democrats win that seat there, they're going to win control of Congress nationwide. Because if women show up this time, that's going to be a, a, a pretty big sign that the Democrats win. And they did. And what we found out <clears throat> is that the blue wave, again, to use the phrase that the journalists talked about, the blue wave that was driven in 2018 <clears throat> was largely driven by suburban, college-educated, and we'll have to say Caucasian women. They turned out in enormous percentages to vote. <clears throat> in, in, in nationwide, women became 52% of the voting population in the United States. Minnesota, it was 54%. Um, um, women basically showed up in the suburbs, third district, second district, districts around the country, and largely shifted um, um, politics. Why is that important? I want to draw to a conclusion so I can get to questions and answers here, is that what most people haven't noticed yet is that this election clearly is part of what I call this critical realignment. What we are seeing now is that the Republican Party is becoming more the party of men, becoming more the party of rural, rural areas, more the party of people without college educations, um, of people um, um, who, who are, um, um, well, well, we'll stay with that. Um, the Democratic Party has become the party of especially women, to some extent still uh, people of color, uh, and that they're still part of the coalition, but suburban women are, are bigger drivers. It has become women who are um, better educated and more affluent. The gender gap between the two parties is enormous. And thinking about it down the line here, if women in suburbs are the major drivers of the Democratic Party, 
What is that perhaps going to mean in terms of the political agenda and the policy agenda um, for what the Democrats are going to be pursuing? Remember, 20 years ago, those college-educated suburban women were voting Republican. Um, this is a pretty big shift that's gone on here politically. Uh, and what we have some ideas of is that we do know that women and men do pursue oftentimes different policy agendas, um, do politics differently. Not always, but oftentimes they do. And so where I set us up for 2020 is to say that we appear to be at a point where there's a significant mix, remixing of our parties party composition, what those parties represent, and if this continues into 2020, we're going to see um, at the next presidential race a pretty significant shift going on. And then, of course, truly my last point is that down the line, we know that the silent generation, the baby boomers, are going to start to exit the political system. The millennials are going to start to show up. Uh, uh, in more percentages, higher percentages. We're going to see the Gen, the Gen Z show up. Their interest, their political agenda is very, very different um, than previous generations. And over the next 10 years, we're going to see a shift that occurs there also. So for all of us who hope to be around in the next 10 years, and I hope all <laughs> of us are, uh, we're going to start to see with this election what I think is really going to culminate within a decade of a significant critical realignment in American politics um, that's going to look very different than it looks like right now. All right, thank you. I'm going to bring the mic around to people with questions. Please wait till the mic comes so that everyone can hear the question as well as the answer. Uh, given everything you've said about the shifting demographics of the country, and the realignment of the parties. Can you think of anyone who would make a good presidential nominee for the Democratic Party oh. in 2020? Get All right, so point, huh? now you put me on the spot. Okay, okay, I'm gonna first tell a great story. Okay, so it's back in 2000, no, no, back in 1996, I'm still teaching at the University of Wisconsin River Falls before I, before I get to Hamlin. And so I'm doing the postmortem on the election you know, and this is, you know, Clinton winning the second term, you know, beating um, Bob Dole. And I don't remember this at the time. Um, apparently, some student asked me the question, all right, so if you're so smart, you know, who's going to win in 2000? And apparently what I said, and I don't remember this until someone contacted me after the 2000 race, what I apparently said is, well, listen, it'll probably be Al Gore running, because usually vice presidents run after presidents run. And I was guessing, and I had just, I had lived in Texas prior to that, and I said, yeah, it'll probably be George Bush against Al Gore. And, and generally, um, Martin Van Buren was the last vice president to win after a president, you know, succeeding the president. I said, yeah, it'll, it'll be Bush beating Gore or something like that. So, so, so this, is, this is pure dumb luck. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, now, if my father were alive, um, um, he would say, if you could really predict the future, uh, can you tell me how the horses will run at the track? Uh, 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 I'm not going to get into my father's gambling habits. We'll let that pass or something like that. No, this is, this is the challenge. This is the real challenge for the Democrats because in, in many ways, if everything that I'm said is, said is correct, um, the, the ideal candidate, I think, is the candidate that, that basically holds together um, um, and mobilizes suburban women to show up to vote. Um, that would be the most likely um, type of scenario. But what we're going to see now, and this is why I also say that the 2020 race is upon us, is remember, the Iowa caucuses will be what? January of 2020. We have the Iowa straw polls that will occur like in August or so. Uh, to be competitive in the Iowa caucuses, you probably have to be what? up and running and organized six months before it, uh, which means somewhere by, let us say, July, maybe June or July of, this, of 2019, you've got to be up and going. Um, you're going to see probably about a dozen Democrats uh, um, declare in the, next, in the next few months. Now, all of you are now 
rolling in your seat saying, Schultz, does this suggest um, that it's Amy Klobuchar? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's always easy to say in your home state to say, um, so and so uh, looks like a star. Uh, uh, it's going to be a challenge for her. You know, that everybody knows Amy Klobuchar in this state. Um, go to New York, you know, go to California. Um, yes, she's appeared on ABC. Yes, she was somewhat of a star, you know, during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. But I put her at a third tier, or second or third tier at this point. The first tier still is, it's, it's, you've got to have what? Biden, Sanders, Warren in the first tier. You have people such as Cory Booker, um, um, Kamala Harris, um, probably in the second tier. Um, Christ, um, Christine Gillibrand is probably somewhere up there in, in the second tier. Um, this is going to be a challenge here. Um, but the Democrats, I think, are still not as united as a party as the Republicans. And that's going to be a real tough thing to do here, to weave it together. But if, again, if I were sort of waving my magic wand, I would say the Democrats need to get somebody to run who's going to be able to figure out um, how to keep that momentum with this rebuilt Democratic Party, which is really a party of, of, um, of suburban women. I'm not sure at this point, and that's the other thing, is that, is that if they want to get young people out to vote, um, a centrist isn't going to do it um, at this point. Centrist also doesn't fit with this pattern here uh, also. I mean, keep in mind, as much as I've said that, that suburban women are the drivers, we should also keep in mind people under 30 are the largest voting bloc in the United States now, uh, but overall still the largest voting bloc are what? Working class white America. Uh, so we've got several different cons big blocks of voters out there all kind of maneuvering. But this pattern here doesn't suggest that you're going to move at least the, the young people as a centrist. On the other hand, keep in mind, suburban women, they may be pro-choice, may be pro-civil rights, but many of them are what? Fiscally conservative also. So we've got to balance lots of these different uh, um, um, interest out there. Uh, I, I doubt it's going to be a centrist, um, given everything that I suggested. Question here. Yes. Uh, why do oh my gosh, Phyllis. All right. <laughs> why do you think white suburban college educated women didn't like Hillary? Boy, that's a why. Okay. Why did they not like Hillary Clinton? Uh, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of speculation here. Okay. First, if we break it down even more, uh, what we know is who really didn't like Hillary Clinton um, in terms of, of, of women were evangelical women. Um, um, uh, that's really pretty clear. Uh, in fact, to me, one of the great paradoxes of politics in the last few years is that the core, the core, core of Trump's support are evangelical voters. Um, so, so we can have a great discussion as, you know, as, as to why you know that. And I'm scratching my head too for all kinds of reasons. Um, that I've heard other stories, and I'd be curious what some of you people think here. Lasting resentment against against Clinton not leaving her husband, um, as I've heard as other possibilities. Um, I'm not sure. It's it's always been perplexing with me. Uh, in a in a whole well, I'll do it here a little bit too. Um, uh, is that before the election? I was giving a series of talks, and, and I would turn to a group like this, let's, and I would say to people, all right, uh, what percentage of the American public do you think would never vote for a woman for president? And I used to say 30%, too high, too low, or about right. And everybody thought I was nuts in terms of being too high. After 2016, I think it was too low. Uh, I actually think we're looking at 35 or 40%. <coughs> That still doesn't explain the, the, the female factor, uh, uh, but I mean there are other reasons why Clinton lost. But exactly zeroing in on it, I, I'm hearing it's along the lines of the resentment towards not leaving Bill, um, um, a subgroup. It's about the being evangelical. I'm not sure. Um, um, there's never been sort of really good polling and parsing of that data here. If anybody's got some good theories on that, I would love to hear. I mean, Phil, <coughs> do you have any good theories on it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. I, I, was, I was hoping you were asking the leading question that you didn't have an answer to or something like that. No, it, I mean, it, 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 it is, but yeah, the, what, what, what doesn't surprise me is the, is 
suburban Republican women leaving the Republican Party. Um, that that makes sense to me, you know, you know, given the issue agendas and the shifts like that. But why they opted to stay home on election day two years ago, um, tougher to figure out, except maybe I'll invoke one answer also, another answer. Um, I still think one of my other favorite books, give me 10 seconds here, uh, go read Tip O'Neill's book called, I think, I can't remember if he called it Man of the House or Speaker of the House. I can't remember which it Man was. Man of the House. And, I, uh, and it's his autobiography. <laughs> and of course, we always know one of the great lines of Tip O'Neill who says, said, never take a vote for granted, always ask for votes. Um, and part of what Clinton's mistake was in 2016, she took votes for granted. And, 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 and she never really went out there and asked women for the, for the vote. And maybe that was part of it, too. Maybe that's maybe the best answer. We've got David. a question back here with the mic. <coughs> yeah. David. She, she gets to control everything. Okay. <laughs> How important was distaste for Trump as a unifying factor for the Democrats in winning the House in 2018, and how important could distaste for Trump be for the Democrats as a unifying factor in 2020? No matter what anybody says, even though polling data, I think, always said health care is the number one issue, the economy is the number one issue, I always thought those were surrogates um, or, or, or immigration. They, they were all surrogates for what? For Trump. I mean, and, uh, you know, Trump wanted to say at the same time, it's all about me and it's not about me. He was right. It was all about him. Um, and the Democrats, I think, significantly benefited, you know, from, from that anti-Trump fervor. Again, especially the polling data is suggesting that suburban women um, were, were, were very, very um, angry with Donald Trump um, and, and, and basically cast very broad votes that threw everybody out. Uh, Phyllis heard this talk. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, and she knows what I'm referring to here. Uh, um, Roz Peterson, um, who 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 is a uh, I'm going to describe her as somewhat of a centrist Republican um, representing Lakeville. I mean, I've known Roz for a while. She. Um, when I gave a talk to a bunch of former state legislators a few weeks ago, she grabs me as I walks in and she had lost her election. And she said, did you know I was going to lose? And I said, no, but in hindsight, now I know why you did. Um, um, and the reason why I say that is that, including in Minnesota, um, voters just went in, especially suburban female voters, and just voted against all Republicans, um, um, because, and partly that they're anti-Trump. Now, as I always want to say, that a lot of times you can get pretty far on being against something. But at some point, you still need the powerful message or narrative uh, about what you're for. Um, and part of what I also think was one of the problems that Trump had four or two years ago, I want to say four years ago, was that it wasn't clear what her narrative was. It, you know, you know it, was, it was her message, I'm just not Trump, um, it's my turn now, or what is it? And I think the challenge for Democrats now um, is articulating um, as they take over the House of Representatives, not just to be the party that opposes Trump, but to be the party that does what? That actually, if, if I were giving him advice, I would say identify your core half dozen issues, pass that legislation, send it to the Senate, make them reject it, um, and then run like hell on that in two years. Uh, Anti-Trump will get you some of the way, but remember, when two years from now, Trump, if he's run, is on the ballot, and if he's on the ballot, uh, his supporters will be highly motivated to show out, show up. And if he doesn't run, what do you do? If by some reason being against against Trump, if he's not on the ballot at all, um, is going to be a challenge. This gentleman. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to something that you touched on okay. earlier in, uh, in you said the 60s and the 70s. Uh, because of the number of swing districts and for other reasons, uh, politics in the legislature and with the White House were coalitional. People came together uh, in areas where they could agree. We now have divided government at the federal level and here in Minnesota. Uh, we've seen the effects of, we've seen what gridlock does right. the last couple, last four or five years, nothing gets done. Do you believe that there are any dynamics or anything at work that will change that going forward the next two to six years, or are we in for two to six years of more gridlock, nothing getting done, even when everybody agrees, for example, 
we need an infrastructure bill. We need to make changes uh, to health care. We need to do things in other areas. Yeah, yeah. My, my um, sort of two observations. My, my pessimistic short-term prognosis is, is that the polarization exists. You know, I mean, I thought, for good or for bad, and you can make your own judgment here, I thought when Trump got elected and the Republicans had control of both houses, that they're going to be able to move whatever they want. I never thought I would see single party gridlock, um, um, which is essentially what we have right now. Now, that speaks to a whole bunch of other issues in terms of Trump's skill sets, et cetera, et cetera, like that. But, um, but short term, I don't see anything breaking up, even though beneath that double hump camel's back, if you can get people beyond the partisan labels, there's powerful agreement on lots of different things. And let's just pick two or three issues right off the bat here, is that despite all the rhetoric that we hear, cut through some of the language, about 80% of the American public says there ought to be universal background checks before the purchases of guns. Uh, uh, there is high percentages of the population that support the banning of certain types of you know, automatic weapons. Uh, uh, we forget about the fact that, that about 60% of the population, if not higher percentage, um, actually support reproductive rights and, um, um, and, and women's right to terminate pregnancies. We know that very high percentages now support LGBTQ rights. Uh, and we can march through a whole bunch of others. I remember back in the 1990s, I used to teach at Minneapolis Community and Technical College as the greatest experience in my life. I taught in a Saturday program, and, and I taught uh, a class on welfare reform. Um, and everybody in the Saturday program I had for several years, they were all on, back at that point, was called AFDC welfare. And I used to bring in the statistic, and public opinion polls would say, Ask the question, do we spend too much, too little, or just about right on welfare? 70% would say, we spend too much on welfare. But then if you could ask the public, do we spend too much, too little, or just about right on, on helping the poor? 70% said, we spend too little on helping the poor. Um, uh, uh, it's about the words and it's about the language. It's about how we frame things. And, 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 I, and right now, the way the two parties are framing things, it automatically leads to a lot of this deadlock also. And, and at some point, we have to figure out how to rhetorically change some of this dialogue. Now, some of this is, some of this is, is not going to be changed by dialogue, by, 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 um, by framing. But certainly, what I'm trying to capture here, I don't know how we tap into that underlying consensus that there is out there on so many issues. You know, you know, maybe I'm in a bubble. I speak mostly in the Twin Cities. You know, if I, I travel the state. I think I have Johnny Cash's I've Been Everywhere Man. You know, I, you know, I play it on the radio because I travel over the state. But even when I go to like rural Minnesota and speak, um, it, I, I, see, I see the agreement on some basic stuff, but we just can't seem to get there. And, and I wish I were a smarter person to tell us how to get there. Yes, John. Can you tell us what you think will be the key wedge issues that determine control of state governorships and state legislatures in 2020? The key issues for state governorships and so forth. Well, if the economists are right, we're probably going to start to see sometime in late 2019, early 2020, the economy start to slow down. Uh, I mean, we're already starting to see signs of that. Uh, we're starting to see, and we can go into a discussion about why GM um, is closing up some factories, why Ford is closing up some factories, why Harley Davidson is, uh, um, why the, the tech companies are starting to take some hits now. Um, but the evidence, I suggest, is going to be what? It's going to be the core issues. It's going to be the economy is going to be looming as it doesn't do as quite as well as in the last few years. Uh, no question, health care is not going away. You know, is that with the repeal of the individual mandate last year, it was last year or earlier this year, you know, by the Republicans and Trump, what we're going to start to see um, is a dramatic increase again in what? Number of uninsured, and with that, the insurance rates are going to go up because the individual mandate was key in part to making sure that, that the um, insurance companies had some actuarial soundness in terms of their policies. So health care is going to be the issue. I think it's going to be the issue all about um, um, the economy. 
Nothing's going to get resolved, I think, on the immigration issue in the next, next year or so. So I'm suspecting it'll be immigration. Those will be the core issues. Okay. okay. In the pivotal elections you described, 1800, 1828, uh, 1860, 1936, there were clear winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And you'd look and say, okay, this side won. Yeah. When we have our alignment, who is going to win and what does that mean? Yeah, good question here. Okay, first notice how I put a lot of question marks here. Those elections seem pretty decisive and clean. Boom, you're right, winner happens, alignment occurs. We've kind of been sort of dragging through an alignment here for like 25 or 30 years, it seems like that. It's, it, you know, maybe even longer now. Um, there's somewhat of an alignment with Nixon, somewhat of an alignment with, with, with Trump. Maybe 2008 was a counter alignment or something like that. So it's, it's not really very clear. Now, longer term, we are going to see, I think, some interesting winners and losers. Now, look at this past election, which was really interesting, is that the Dividing line isn't just under 30, it's under 45. Um, people under the age of 30, when they showed up to vote, um, were voting at about 61% for Democrat. Um, under 45, um, it also seemed pretty significantly high for, for Democrats. Roy Teixeira and a few others a few years ago made the argument, Roy Teixeira being a, a, a Democratic tactician or strategist, made the, made the argument, you know, demographics are destiny. Demographics are not destiny. Demographics lead to the possibilities of significant change, but you still have to have good candidates, good messages, good strategy, et cetera, et cetera. But if everything is going the way I think it's gonna go and the way demographers are talking about here, both the Democratic and Republican parties, in terms of how they look today, are gonna to look dramatically different um, in a few years because their core bases are gonna be gone. Um, they're going to be gone, and they're going to get replaced. And the question is, what are they going to look like? Um, um, and, 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 and it suggests a, 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 an American future that probably looks, if we can use today's language, more liberal, more secular uh, than it is now. Some of you might have seen a piece in the Star Tribune a couple of weeks ago where it said something to the effect of the headline, <coughs> the, 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 what the largest growing political aff or, uh, religious affiliation in, in Minnesota is none. Um, is is we are we are think about how dramatic the shift is going to be in the next 15 to 20 years, when we go from a country that was 40 years ago, still even 20 years ago, that was still 90 percent plus what 90 percent um, Christian, to a country that is going to be probably maybe 60 percent religious or Christian. Um, for anybody who's ever been to Europe, um, we're moving sort of the direction of Europe of being kind of, uh, I would call it like like secular Christian or or secular non-denominational. Um, that and think about how that plays out for social issues. Um, so the parties that can capture that new sense of of an America that's going to be less religious, more multicultural, less Christian is going to be the party that wins it. We have a question on the floor here. Ah. <laughs> I won't rise for the occasion. Uh, three weeks ago, we had a different speaker in this group, and I don't know how many of you attended that one. But I was rather, it, the previous question a couple back about some of these issues that we should be able to agree upon because there's 80% support. Uh, Dr. Junker or, uh, horrified me at the end and said, nothing will happen because of the 200 people that finance 25% of the elections. And so they will win. And, and I should say that was Dr. Billy uh, Junker, Junker yes. from St. Thomas. It, I know. I okay. Know, I know who he is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of stories here. I had a question. One of them is some of you might know that at one time I was the executive director and chair of Common Cause Minnesota. Uh, um, and back in 98, on the 25th anniversary of the Saturday Night Massacre, um, we brought Archibald Cox to Minnesota to speak. And I had a chance to talk to him. 
and and Arch and I and this is something that I've always I've always talked about also. Archibald Cox said in far more profound ways than I ever could. He said, the rules about who can give money in politics are the rules that determine the rules of the game. Uh, and, and Archibald Cox is fundamentally correct. And I don't want to under under appreciate or don't want to ignore the fact that about about role of money in politics. It is a major driver. Uh, but it is a battle that we've won that was won once before beginning of the 20th century, but it's absolutely correct unless we figure out how, how to address the inordinate amount of money in our political system, uh, it's going to continue um, um, to dominate in, in significant ways. And I still think, though, having said that, that that money is still going to face some major structural changes um, in terms of population and demographic shifts, um, and, and who wins actually becomes a great question. So I'm not ignoring it. I think it's actually absolutely. And it's either rising up or the grassroots changes, and the grass is changing. Yeah. This lady. I'm wondering, it's pretty clear now that for most people, climate change is very far down on their list of things to worry about. And, and maybe this does relate to the question the other woman just asked about um, financing of the people who have the money and the power and want things to stay. Do you see any time in the future, 10, 15 years, when that's going to change? Uh, will we simply, I mean, will it just things sort of fall apart and people will never quite catch on? Or do you, do you see any time when this might become important? Do you see this maybe with the millennials or the Gen Xers? Yes, I do, actually. If you look at the, if you get, look at the polling data for, for millennials and, and for the um, um, Gen Zs, actually, it's the Gen Zs who are coming after us, uh, that this is nearly the top of their list of issues. Now, they, of course, are still concerned about the issues that all of us are concerned about, uh, as I describe it getting a good job, paying for an education. Um, I'm not being silly when I say my students talk about what? Um, falling in love and having a family. I mean, I mean, there's some core things that they still care about. Um, but I'd say more so than the baby boomers, more so than the silence, even the, you know, even the Gen Xs. Um, um, they, they see that as, as a big issue. And again, think about what I've been talking about here. We could also look at how the opposition to addressing global warming in the environment has a generational aspect to it. And my nice way of describing it is, is that the core generations that are opposing that um, are going to be exiting the political system in the next few years. Uh, um, that's my nice way of saying it. Um, yeah, so, so, so we're, so we're going to see, we're going to see that shift um, occur. Now, of course, from a scientist point of view, you know, the question is, are we moving rapidly enough? Um, and probably not. Uh, I was one of those people who last week, I didn't read the thousand pages, you know, but you know, the report that came out last week, the abbreviated version is only 160 pages. Uh, uh, and, and for those of you, you know, who are um, going to Florida, uh, Florida, as we know, won't exist, you know, by the end of the century. You know, that, that, that report basically says that we're going to see the sea levels rise around Florida by approximately six to eight feet. And, um, and that pretty much takes out most of the Florida peninsula at this point. So, Bob, and I just mention that because the effects are going to become even more dramatic, you know, in the next few years. But I don't think it's going to change people's minds. One of the things, okay, what is it? Hegel, a philosopher, once said that one of the lessons of history is that we never learn the lessons of history. Um, <laughs> um, um, but one of the lessons of history is the fact that, that people don't change their minds. What happens? One generation who believes one thing exits, another replaces them. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. And whether or not it's too late, that's, that's, that's really the question now. Yeah. We have a question back here. Great. When you were um, discussing the three tiers of Democratic candidates, you didn't include uh, Beto O'Rourke. I just wonder what you think of him. Beto O'Rourke, it's always, he's clearly going to have his constituency in, tw in, you know, in, in 2020. The leap from going from Congress, you know, House of Representatives to the presidency, that's a pretty, pretty big movement. Uh, not ruling him out, you know, but but but, cer but certainly in terms of 
and, and, and do I, where do I put him? He's not first tier. Is he second or third tier? I don't know. I mean, he's clearly going to be a name that's out there uh, to, to, to be looked at. Uh, how he plays on the national stage, that's going to be an interesting question over the next, what, six months or so. And whether he even wants to run, I don't know. Uh, that's also a good question, too. Now, I've also heard some people say that he's, he's an ideal, what, vice presidential candidate, too, in terms of a possibility. So, so there's, there's lots of opportunities. So, so he's, he's probably not gone from the national arena. I'm just really not sure at this point how to assess him in terms of where does he fit in that tier. Does he, and does, what he, does he want to run? Does he want to run? There are going to be quite a lot of women heading to the House of Representatives in 2019, having won elections across the country. Um, what, if any, effect will they have on the way Congress does business? In other words, will they have an impact on polarization? Will they increase it? Will they have no impact? Or will they decrease it? What does the research show? What does the research show? Okay, there, there is, well, clearly you can't say that every woman will do X or believe Y in the same way that we can't say that every person who's male or black, et cetera, et cetera, like that, or Asian. Uh, but in general, we have some pretty good research out there. And I think Barbara Conway's book, if I'm, I think that's who it is, one, did one of the first books on it that really looked at women and public policy and women and legislators um, and suggests that women do have a style that is different than men, you know, collectively, certainly not every single one, um, um, and that the issues that they pursue are oftentimes very different than men. I suspect we're going to see a, a, a small shift um, in terms of how some things get done in Congress. But keep in mind something also interesting. Yes, this is going to be uh, we, we elected the largest number of women to Congress this year ever. What does Congress shift from? 19 to 22 percent female. Keep that in mind also is that, is that you know, I mean, we're talking about a, an earthquake or what, whatever had happened. It's still only 22 percent. Is 22 percent enough to, um, to really reshape the House? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, if you think that the age of the presidential candidates is going to be significant? It, is the age of the presidential candidates going to be significant? Clearly to my students it is. Uh, uh, <laughs> is that, I can't remember what we were talking about recently, and I'm going to forget the exact ages. And I wrote them down, like, you know, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, uh, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, and even I threw in to say Nancy Pelosi and Elizabeth Warren. And I think one of my students blurted out and said, God, they're all old, aren't they? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, 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 and, 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 and the nasty comments afterwards about them saying how they hoped they were going to exit the political system soon. I'm like, yeah, but okay, okay. I'll go <laughs> but, but, but no, this, this does become kind of an interesting question now, is that, that for at least some of the major presidential candidates you know, who are being floated out there, you know, let's let's put again. Let's say for the Democrats, we're going to have, you know, let's say Sanders, Warren, and and um, Biden. I think Warren is the youngest at 69. Uh, uh, and I have, you know, you know, as somebody who's now 60, I have nothing against older people, of course. Uh, uh, but you you have to start to ask the question about building a party for the future, you know, or, and on both sides also, um, and in terms of where's your next generation coming, and, and I'm not sure how much those candidates will excite younger people. Now, having said that, of course, the irony was in 2016, people under 30 were really excited by Bernie Sanders. Uh, uh, he was their candidate. But yeah, I, I'm sort of hoping, you know, that we can start to get that next generation of people coming up. We've got time for a few more questions. Is there anyone who has not yet asked a first question who has a question? Okay, I'm gonna give it to this lady and then I'll. Thank you. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the, the um, issues that are facing Nancy Pelosi between among the newly elected progressives who are kind of opposing her but don't have a candidate, but want to also change the way the party is run, the way politics is run in the House, how chairmanships are picked, and all the rest of that, and, and how you think that's going to impact how she can, I assume she's going to get, I'm sure she's going to get elected, but 
Um, anyway, just talk about sure. that whole, and may, whether that portends something about what change we're going to have to look at as thing, and should look at sure. as things go forward. Yeah, I think one of the challenges Pelosi faces right off the bat, of course, is the fact that, that her margin of, of, of a majority is not big. So she can't afford to lose too many votes um, um, uh, in terms of, 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 of Democrats. And it would be great to say, I wish I could say that she's that the Democrats can afford to lose a few Democratic votes and they're going to pick up some Republicans vote there. But the voting patterns aren't going to suggest that. Uh, now, there may be no place for some of those Democrats to go but to say they have to support Pelosi, because you're right, they don't have an alternative. Two, uh, I can't imagine at the end of the day that they're going to basically keep voting down. At least they, 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 if they were smart, they wouldn't keep voting down all the things that the Democrats are going to try to push. Um, I think the real challenge, and I was talking to one of my former students about this yesterday, is, is that it, Pelosi's task, again, I still think is if, if everything I've said is accurate, she has to make sure she keeps suburban women in the fold and coming back in 2020. If the Democrats pursue an agenda that I think suburban women perceive to be um, too, too far out of the mainstream, um, do they risk having those women not show up to vote again in 2020? Um, at the same time, again, the challenge is, is that these these younger, you know, progressive, you know, members represent constituents who want to see something shift um, shift in terms of American politics. Uh, I I really don't envy her job, you know, in terms of what she has to weave together here. Uh, uh, however, she's a very smart politician. Um, uh, yeah, she's a she's a very smart politician, and the other thing I was going to say is. On one level, she, of course, is going to be what? The Hillary Clinton of 2020. And what I mean by that um, if you, is that take that 30 or 35 percent or 40 percent of the American electorate um, that, that I said wouldn't vote for a woman in 2016. I wouldn't be surprised if now, as we saw in the 2018 elections, um, the election is running against Nancy Pelosi also. Um, so these, again, I wish I could give you a great answer in terms of how to navigate it. Uh, but but she did reasonably well in the two years in Obama in terms of holding together the coalitions. If anything, I would have faulted Obama more um, for, not, for not pushing on certain things. I think she did a pretty good job back then. I think we have time for just one more question. Is there anyone who has not yet asked a question who has a question? If not, OK, I will. Can I just send it down this way? Do you do you think uh, Trump will make it to 2020? Do I think Trump will make it to 2020? Yeah. You mean politically, legally, or living? <laughs> in any way, in any way. Uh, yes, I do actually. I actually do. Uh, I. Um, I don't think he's going any place, you know, sh you know, short term at this point. Of course, the real, I mean, we've got two, two or three major wild cards, of course, you know. Um, one wild card, of course, is, is what the Democrats in the House do, you know, you know, you know, in terms of what agenda they pursue. Second is what the Mueller investigation is going to be reporting out probably sometime in the beginning of the year. Um, I still suspect we are going to see an oodle of, in, of indictments, but Mueller's not going to indict the President of the United States. For everybody who's jumping up and down and waiting for that, um, one of the things that's pretty clear is Mueller's going to follow the 1974 Justice Department mem memo that says sitting presidents can't be indicted. It's the political solution. That is through, through impeachment. So, so he's not going to get indicted. Uh, whether the Democrats pursue impeachment, that becomes a, a tactically an interesting question. Um, so it's one, it's going to be the Mueller investigation. Two, it's going to be the, what, the, what strategy the Democrats take in the House. And then finally, coming back to what somebody asked me about issues before, um, uh, that uh, the, the signs are, again, that the economy is going to is going to start to contract. It's going to start to slow down, unfortunately, you know, sometime later this year, or early next year. And that's going to sort of be like, like the third wing that has a big impact on them. Uh, 
Having said all of that, you asked the you're ask second question. If he runs again, will he win? I wouldn't rule it out. I wouldn't rule it out. I think we're at the end of our formal time. If you have other questions, perhaps uh, Dr. Schultz could stay a little longer.